I shall pass you over to Imre Rad. Hello. Hello, welcome everyone. Let me start with a short introduction. I'm Imre Rad. I'm Imre Rad. And uh, I had been working as a software engineer and nowadays as a security engineer. But these two roles have been swapped multiple times during my career. While working as a, a software, full time software developer, I usually spend my free time on bug bounties, uh, security research, and su such. And while being a full time security researcher, I usually miss the software development, so that's uh, what I try doing in my free time. I'm currently employed by Google. Um, I'm in a security team, uh, in one of the security teams we had a uh, cloud pl uh, platform. Uh, it's called Cloud Hardening and it has not much to do with uh, the talk that I'm giving because uh, this, is a, this is about the security research uh, that I carried out as a 20-person project. Uh, that's uh, a concept at Google where you can spend certain amount of your time on something that is not closely rela related to the daily duties of your team. Um, the short disclaimer is uh, that this is not complete yet. There's some some aspects of this project are not sorted out uh, completely. Uh, the definition of uh, parser differential issues is uh, when given two different parser implementations of the same thing and you feed them the very same input and they result uh, something different. Uh, this, in my opinion, this is a vulnerability class that is not really widely known. Uh, at least that's definitely not something like XSS that is even part of uh, school books nowadays. Uh, maybe the most known subcategory of this vulnerability class is HTTP request smuggling attacks, where uh, two different HTTP servers or proxies um, get the same request and they interpret it differently, uh, resulting in some nasty effects. But, of course, any kind of technologies and data formats uh, could be affected by parsing differential issues. Uh, and why? why? Why may that happen? Um, some, some data structures are pretty complex. Think about um, something like XML, for example. Uh, there may be some ambiguities in their specification and uh, popular data formats are usually implemented by multiple different authors in multiple different programming languages. Basically, this is a, the perfect recipe for parsing differential issues. And also, let me, uh, let me highlight some uh, typical root causes of these issues uh, when authors make some de decisions uh, with regards to the implementation for sake of robustness or for sake of speed, uh, that's when usually uh, that's something that yields to parser differential issues. And as security researchers, our goal is to find these anomalies and uh, try to exploit these inconsistencies. It, yeah, I, I forgot, I'll switch space one more time. So this all began with a real-life uh, exploit, a real-life vulnerability. The credit goes to one of my colleagues, uh, Harsh. It affected two uh, services uh, of the Google infrastructure. One of them is an API infra service um, that uh, delegates common functionality to a central framework. It uh, takes care of authorization, quota management, telemetry, all kind of boring stuff. Uh, that is usually hidden by, uh, to, to the end users. And the other um, part of this pair, uh, service pair, is called Gaia. That's the identity, identity management um, solution across multiple different Google products. This API infra service, uh, among their API methods, supported um, um, uh, there was an API method that accepted a signed JWT, the JSON Web Token. Uh, this JSON Web Token is compatible with uh, what you may be familiar with uh, if you, if you uh, have used uh, the IAM uh, APIs of the Google Cloud Platform. 
Um, there, are, there are some methods there called sign blob or sign GWUT, or you may even download or create and then download a service account key and then do the math yourself and uh, create a, a JWUT that, is, that would be valid in this context. Um, this API Infra Service supported a special assertion uh, for a special service account called Cloud Console Partner. Uh, this is a, a feature that was added by the product team in order to support some third party integrations, integration with some third party vendors. Um, and the JWT itself was verified by the Gaia service as yet another API method called internally under the hood. This is the crafted JWT payload here um, that you are seeing. This, uh, this is the payload of the JWT. Uh, the API Infra service used a parser called JSON CPP and the other was using a protobuf, protobuf JSON parser. If uh, you take a look at the bottom, uh, you may notice that uh, the issuer field is present twice and the second one looks pretty weird. It's prefixed by some Unicode weirdness there. Uh, and this was the root cause why these two different JSON parsers actually considered this message, interpreted this me message differently. The top one is how the API Infra Service thought this JWT was issued by, and the bottom one is how Gaia thought this JWT uh, was created. Uh, and as such, um, as uh, I mentioned during the previous um, slide, it is possible to create valid JWTs using the standard official APIs or by even by doing yourself using standard industry libraries. Uh, so the bottom one is something that is that could be an attack, attacker controlled thing and when the API infra service received this uh, method with this uh, crafted J JSON um, JWT payload, it uh, just forwarded to the Gaia service, it returned a successful response. This was signed properly by the bottom uh, issuer there, so basically the attacker controlled one, and then the API infra service kept processing and kept doing the, the business logic uh, according as if it was signed by this Cloud Console Partner third party special service account, and then it took uh, these special assertions uh, into account. So this, is, this was basically um, an authentication bypass or impersonation issue um, that could have been exploited by third parties, but uh, it was an internal finding of one of my colleagues. These special Unicode characters here could be visualized like this, uh, actually a question mark, uh, which is called the Unicode surrogate. And uh, as far as I understand, that's um, that is used when um, when there is a code pointer or something that that is a character encoding related problem, and that's what is usually uh, displayed when uh, the character conversion uh, cannot be done as expected. So basically, that's it um, about uh, the original issue that triggered this research. Um, then. Uh, this uh, research project, project has started with these goals that you are seeing on this slide. The primary objective was to find additional um, attack primitives, so basically similar uh, low-level constructs that an attacker could use to uh, gain similar uh, weird effects among two different parsers. Uh, I was focusing on the JSON um, syntax, JSON data format, and the JSON parsers that are currently used at Google. Uh, the criteria was obviously to find uh, inputs that are different by at least two parsers, and also has the potential of from from security point of view, basically. Um, I built a special, I built some custom tooling uh, in order to find uh, to to meet this goal. Um, more about that uh, on the uh, follow-up slides. And the secondary objective was to find potentially affected targets, which uh, could be quite uh, challenging 
given the scale and the number of uh, microservices and RPC interactions uh, used in internally. And uh, the third one, third objective was to try to try finding a way that could eliminate this problem or at least preventing in some certain uh, situations uh, where it is possible uh, at the pre-phase, pre-parse pre phase. So before some, before the, the the real business logic would have been executed. Um, the custom tooling I mentioned turned into a framework that I built. Uh, it is based on this RPC, uh, this uh, proto buff message and service. That's what uh, you need to implement for each of the for each parser that you are willing to support for for this uh, for finding differentials. Uh, so you need to implement it um, with. You need to implement it at least with two different parsers, but uh, it uh, it is not limited to only two. Actually, this was one of the reasons why I started uh, developing something from scratch, uh, so that this framework could uh, could find differentials among multiple different parsers at the same time. Um, so this would. And this parse method would be invoked uh, by the framework and uh, the JSON parsing or whatever parsing would be executed in this backend uh, service and then it is supposed to return uh, that input in a, some kind of canonical representation, something that can be, uh, can, can be compared later on by the framework. This is the high level architecture. Uh, the most important component is the diff server um, at, the, at the middle. Uh, on the right side, you are seeing the parser backends. That's the thing I've been talking about at the previous slide. So any number of parser backends uh, can be uh, implemented and uh, attached to the differential server. Uh, the inputs themselves are generated by a fuzzer. Currently, three different fuzzers are in, uh, implemented and supported, um, including libfuzzer. Uh, they keep generating new and new inputs and uh, forward them to the differential server that uh, in turn distributes them towards to the parser backends, uh, receives back the response, that canonical response, and then compares them. When it uh, encounters a differential, so at least two of these parsers return something different, then it uh, stages this input along with all the responses uh, for sake of some additional uh, post-processing uh, that is executed later on asynch asynchronously. Uh, and the motivation there was to uh, minify the results and more about that later. Um, so the most part of the business logic is uh, implemented in the in this diff server component. Um, that's where, uh, basically, that's the heart of uh, this uh, system. Uh, and I forgot to mention one more uh, design goal was with this architecture that uh, it should be flexible. So it would be not limited to JSON only, but later on if you want to carry out some additional research targeting another format, uh, that could be done rel relatively easily. So some kind of modular approach, uh, that, uh, that's what I wanted to pursue. Um, I encountered a couple of challenges during the way. Uh, for example, I was about to use cluster files at the beginning. That's uh, the that's an official solution um, product by Google that is used uh, broadly um, to fuzz softwares at scale. So it's a huge infra infrastructure, thousands of virtual machines behind that. Uh, but uh, it was designed with different uh, objectives in mind. So it's, uh, it's rather focusing on uh, finding memory corruption issues uh, and uh, trying to find issues where uh, the target process is crashing for certain input. And that's, even though probably that's something that could have been done, I mean, I, 
I could have implemented uh, the diff server component in a way that it would crash whenever it encounters a differential and then trying to somehow uh, squeeze some information about uh, the backend states uh, into the core dump itself, but uh, I rather decided to uh, build something lightweight from scratch. Uh, I made a design mistake. I, uh, for sake of, I don't know. Um, so there is this RPC uh, framework solution used internally inside Google. It's called Stubby. Uh, it's really comfortable to use. It's supported by uh, our internal uh, developer workflows uh, pretty good. It's super comfortable. So for the sake of the first version of the prototype, I was using this one. Uh, but I realized uh, later on that it's uh, actually not supported for every single uh, programming languages out there. For example, Node.js uh, support is limited. And also, I realized that uh, if I wanted to open source this framework later on, then I will need to refactor it and use something else instead. Because Stubby is an internal only solution proprietary to Google, so I will rather I will probably need to switch to something else later on, like gRPC or something like that. Uh, there was also something to resolve with regards to um, speed and performance. If you are familiar with fuzzing, uh, then you know that it needs to be as fast as possible, otherwise it won't yield really good results. Um, and uh, the naive approach with that architecture uh, I, I, I show you, uh, showed you in the previous slide that uh, I got really pure performance. And that's because of, uh, of the multiple operating system uh, processes involved and uh, how those uh, synchronous RPC interactions were executed uh, among them. So how to drive uh, fuzzing across multiple OS processes, uh, the solution was pretty simple here. The trick was to batch uh, the inputs uh, and uh, don't, do not send uh, inputs to the parser backends one by one, but rather grouping them in thousands uh, together um, and receive the, the response uh, with thousands of them this way. Uh, I was able to achieve a speed very similar to uh, fuzzing uh, an application that is uh, like, a, like a native application focusing on JSON parsing directly and no, no over, overheads, uh, nothing at all. Uh, and the next challenge was after I, g I managed to uh, get some proper speeds and managed to get some differentials quickly. The next one was to try to reduce the number of them because uh, it was uh, generating too much. And uh, I realized that uh, reviewing all the results uh, would, be, would be pain. Um, if you uh, take a look at the, the bottom of this slide, there are two, uh, those two huge integers there. This, are, this, is, this would be a differential, I mean one of, one of them. Uh, uh, big, big numbers tend to be a problem with, uh, with this JSON parsing uh, among JSON parsers because they are usually interpreted differently. Different parsers uh, truncate them, truncate these numbers and they don't store the whole number as is, but uh, the granularity is lost. So in this case, both of these uh, huge numbers would have been and was found by the fuzzer, actually. But uh, from our uh, point of view, um, for the sake of this security research, we, we didn't want to consider them being different uh, findings because uh, they are not. Uh, so how could, uh, what could be done in order to identify that these uh, findings are actually the same? And uh, what to do that, uh, how, how, how to do that? And this is where uh, that uh, post-processing asynchronous workflow uh, comes into the picture that you have seen on the high-level architecture slide. Uh, the idea here was to um, stage uh, the findings, the differentials themselves, and then replaying them 
uh, to another build of the very same parcels that are basically the parcel backends, but this time uh, they are executed uh, using uh, the, uh, the instrumented version of them. This way, it is possible to generate a line coverage output. So basically, when there is a differential, then this post-processing workflow is executed under the hood in the background, uh, line coverage outputs are generated, and then the diff server logic is able to compare them and uh, basically recognize that only the very same lines were affected in this uh, test case, like uh, in, other, uh, in, in, ca in the case of uh, some other findings. And uh, using this uh, approach, uh, it was possible to merge uh, a lot of, lot of, lot of differential findings together. Um, okay, second slide of uh, the challenges: um, this coverage, line coverage generation tooling. Again, is something I use an internal uh, software to do that, which was super easy and comfortable to use, but uh, again, it's not uh, open source, it's not uh, available outside, so that's yet, yet another something that I will need to refactor before I will be able to open source this framework. Um, and there were some additional challenges here, like um, we, uh, to run this uh, framework, to find uh, the differentials. I was not using my developer desktop, uh, but rather I was using um, some internal uh, job processing uh, solution, which required packaging all the dependencies, binaries, executables, uh, corpus, uh, things together into something that is similar to a container image, but again, different internally. Uh, this included, by the way, the, the launcher executable binary of the fuzzer itself as well. And uh, it turned out that this coverage tooling that I was relying on that was uh, not, not really meant to be for this use case. So that's yet another thing that uh, I had to uh, work around. And also, uh, it was, uh, I also encountered the limitation here, core pack packages like both Python and Golang features, uh, JSON parser by default as part of the core of uh, the software programming language. And uh, this uh, coverage tooling was, was, it just did not support that and didn't generate any line coverage output that way. So what I did here, I basically uh, decoupled uh, uh, the implementation, the, the source code that belongs to the JSON parsing pieces and uh, I basically just handle them as if they were out, outside something external to the programming language itself. Then, uh, given that uh, fuzzing was not running on my developer desktop, I also needed to implement uh, a way to persist the results. Um, for sake of simplicity, I didn't want to um, use a um, database, a network of teach database solution like um, SQL or something like that, or NoSQL database, something. But I rather decided to use uh, basically a simple network at each file share. And um, I also I also had to implement something to facilitate the triaging of the findings uh, because uh, of multiple reasons. One of them is to verify myself uh, whether I did this line coverage based uh, finding merging logic correctly or not. So this is how the web UI of the framework was born. Uh, this is the dashboard page uh, that you are seeing. Uh, in the first box, uh, it features some statistics about the parser backends themselves. Uh, process ID of uh, the running process, the number of launches, because there is also a, lightweight supervisor logic uh, as part of the diff server. So in the case of one of the parcel backends would crash, it would just detect that and uh, re restart the parcel backend uh, under the hood. Uh, the second box is some statistics about um, the number of differentials themselves. In this case, 
the Deep Financial Server has received 25,000 uh, um, inputs from the Pfizer frontend, and it found 26 of them to be differentials. And it also, this is something I haven't mentioned yet, I also implemented some hard-coded uh, classification logic into this component. So some of um, the more typical differentials in the case of the, in the JSON context uh, now have some um, logic that is able to recognize that uh, based, on the pot based on the presence of certain patterns in the input. In this case, uh, exponential numbers were uh, 18 among the 26 findings, and uh, six of them uh, contain some kind of Unicode-related, uh, they are some Unicode-related findings, and two of them are unknown. Uh, the middle box uh, shows some progress, uh, gives some feedback about uh, this post-processing uh, workflow, the, the progress of that because that's uh, pretty slow. Um, so this is why I decided to uh, include some, some kind of feedback about that, where it is, how many uh, of the inputs haven't been post-processed yet. And the first box is about uh, the number of unique inputs that uh, the framework has identified so far. Last one is about text. Uh, each of the inputs uh, can uh, you may, you may attach text to any of the inputs, uh, any of the differentials that the server uh, has found. Uh, some texts are attached automatically. Uh, for example, when a certain parser succeeds with um, parsing a certain input, then the corresponding tag is attached automatically. In this case, for example, like parsed by Go JSON core means that uh, uh, eight of these inputs were parsed successfully by uh, Golang's core uh, JSON parser. This is the list view. Um, the first 16 bytes of the inputs are um, displayed. In the columns you are seeing these tags. Um, X denotes that uh, it is, uh, that tag is present for that input uh, in, that, uh, in that test. And uh, it is also possible to filter the inputs uh, using um, those checkboxes at the, at the top. So it's, it's pretty easy to do something like show me all the inputs that were, that affects, uh, affects the, I don't know, the Golang parser and were not yet triaged yet. So in other words, uh, that I haven't seen so far. Uh, and this is the profile page of one of the findings. Uh, the input is a huge number here. Uh, at the top, uh, there are the, the texts uh, displayed that are currently attached. You may attach an additional one. Uh, you may download the input, the raw input itself. Um, then at the results section, uh, you are seeing which of the parsers uh, succeeded with parsing this input and uh, how they returned. Uh, how they basically represented this input internally. Um, and um, as I have mentioned already, huge numbers uh, is one of the, the known category where these parsing issues uh, may happen. And in this case, uh, it seems that uh, the granularity is lost in case of node and go, go uh, for, for numbers that are uh, so high. Um, and at the bottom of this page, it is possible to download the line coverage output for, for troubleshooting or debugging purposes. Um, about the current state and the future steps, so the framework and the tooling is uh, ready, but would need some additional cycles, refactorings, before I can open source it. Uh, to identify affected uh, internet products. I was able to use uh, the pretty awesome internet databases uh, at Google. Um, for example, we've got uh, profiling data along with stack traces of pretty much everything. Uh, and this way it was possible to, uh, to find uh, applications that are using a certain uh, JSON parser. Uh, that way 
I, I knew which applications were using a certain JSON parcel, and I've already got uh, a list of known bad combinations. So it was possible to find these pairs of applications that uh, uh, could be problematic. And then using yet another database, joining that together, uh, that database is about the RPC dependencies. So whenever service A invokes service B, B then uh, it uh, shows up in, in this database as a, as a row there. Uh, it, was, it was possible to join these information, join these tables together, and this way uh, I managed to generate a list of potentially affected uh, service pairs. It's not perfect because we do not have information about uh, the inputs being parsed by, by these JSON parsers. Uh, as uh, one of the requirements of exploiting a parser differential issue is that uh, both of those parsers are uh, working on the same input, on the very same. And this is not something that is, um, has visibility in these databases, but it's, uh, it's, a, good, it's a good start. Uh, and we also uh, improved uh, one of the, um, the, um, the important internal cryptographic libraries that is heavily used to uh, work with JWTs, JSON Web Tokens. Uh, so, so that it was improved, it uh, rejects uh, those inputs that uh, be, even before the parsing phase uh, that contains uh, certain problematic patterns. And um, for the future, as I mentioned, I would like to open source uh, this thing and uh, it would be also awesome to uh, resume this work and um, uh, focus on different data formats as well, like XML, YAML, or, or such. So the last uh, few minutes are about uh, the findings themselves. So thanks for your patience so far. I guess this is what you were most interested about anyway. Uh, so JSON is uh, pretty simple after all. And um, for this reason, I was actually surprised uh, about these findings because I didn't expect uh, so many uh, interesting ones. But it seems that uh, it is indeed quite um, easy to uh, implement parsers differently that uh, uh, behave differently for certain inputs. So in this case, this number is relatively big, but not I hope the, uh, the font size is big enough to see, but uh, the point is there is this number here. It's not uh, exponentially huge. Uh, and still, uh, two of the, uh, some of the parsers are off by two. Uh, this may be a problem in financial space. Um, this, uh, this is not something I expected uh, with numbers at, at this, uh, in this range. Then, uh, it seems that Golang uh, truncates um, numbers at around byte 16, and uh, only digits zero uh, are returned later on. So in the internal representation, uh, this uh, level of granularity is lost. Uh, exponential representations still, um, this is uh, again something that's um, um, surprising because these different parsers uh, represent these numbers actually differently. And uh, it's, it's interesting to see uh, how many different ways you can express the, the same number. Then, this one, uh, infinity is not a token that is part of the specification. Still, uh, Python is perfectly happy to accept this input. Uh, infinity is uh, is something that uh, it's um, it's happy to go on with, and uh, this other uh, parser uh, JSON for Java, it, uh, it and it is just robust enough to turn it into a string. So, um, frankly, I uh, I was quite surprised when I saw this infinity token. I I just never even thought about uh, it uh, would be supported by any JSON parsers anywhere. Apostrophes. Um, 
JSON. The JSON specification supports only quotation marks, but not apostrophes. Still, there are at, there are at least two parsers that, uh, that are robust enough to accept this syntax, the syntax with apostrophes, and uh, they turned it into uh, standard quotation mark quoted strings. Uh, and SIMD JSON also succeeds with parsing and it just uh, returns the original version uh, with, uh, uh, with apostrophes. Escapes are also a um, source of problems. Uh, in this case, backslash hash mark uh, is present in the input. This is not a valid escape sequence uh, from JSON point of view. And some of the parsers silently just ignore um, the backslash character here and uh, they just drop that character. And uh, SIMD JSON uh, also accepts this syntax and it just relays uh, the backslash uh, character uh, as is. Uh, if this is present in some file pass or URL or something, that uh, may, be, may be a problem in some uh, integrations. Comments, uh, JSON does not support comments. Still, it seems uh, JSON, again, is uh, robust enough to just silently ignore them. Some other parsers, even though ignore that, but they uh, seem to fall back to something uh, default value there, like in case the JSON format parser, where they where that parser returns an empty array for whatever reason, design decision, I don't know. And SIMD JSON, again, just relays everything as is. Uh, this expression here on this slide, zero uh, exponential one, is interesting because some of the parsers return it as a simple zero and some others uh, return it as a exponential expression and simple zero is usually true when it is present in a boolean uh, expression and all the others uh, may, be, uh, may, be, may be evaluated as a true expression when uh, they are evaluated as a, as a, as a boolean. Negative zero is again was quite surprising to me because I didn't expect um, that being accepted by any JSON parsers, still it is, uh, it seems uh, a thing, uh, but uh, probably without much security relevance here. Space as a separator, that character at the middle in, in this dictionary uh, here, uh, uh, in this JSON object here. So this is a, this should be pure garbage. I believe this should be rejected by every JSON implementation because this is not in line with the specification at all. Still, uh, in this case, it's not JSON, but uh, JSON simple that uh, is happy with the syntax and it even basically corrects it. Um, and uh, this uh, input is accepted. And in, in the case of SIMD JSON, it's, uh, Again, succeeds, it succeeds and it just relays uh, the, the broken input actually with the space removed. Uh, this one is uh, funny. Uh, two binary garbage characters are present uh, in the middle as part of a string. Uh, a couple of parsers return some garbage but represent it differently. And Jackson, the popular Jackson uh, library for JSON, uh, it converts this garbage input to a forward looking slash. Uh, no, no idea why, but it's, it's reproducible. Uh, in this case, there is a binary garbage byte present uh, in this structure, and some of the parsers uh, turn it into a string, and some others truncate uh, the input, and for some reason the first uh, follow-up um, digit is, is kept. Non-unique case. Uh, according to the specification of JSON, um, I'm quoting it, the names within an object should be unique. So this is crystal clear. The names uh, should be unique. 
All right, but what should a, a compliant parser do when it still encounters such an input? Throw an exception or keep the first one or keep the last one or what is it, what, what is it supposed to do? It's not specified. Uh, the answer is, uh, well, at least it seems that uh, the typical way to, typical answer to this problem is in the case of most of the parsers to keep the last occurrence uh, as you are seeing here. Uh, where you see is kept for uh, field A uh, for like five different parsers, but JSON Proto actually concatenates those uh, values instead of uh, doing something <laughs> something else. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't really get uh, the decision behind this uh, implementation detail. Um, Broken Unicode question, uh, broken Unicode character is sometimes converted into a standard ASCII question mark. Sometimes it is converted to uh, Unicode surrogate character. Sometimes it is converted into, uh, you know, in the, in the input here, uh, we are using the backslash U and two hexade hexadecimal uh, number. Uh, so basically the long representation of the two-byte character and sometimes it is uh, turned into the, the short two-byte Unicode character there. Uh, and again, it's uh, in interpreted differently by a bunch of parsers. Unicode surrogates, this is um, the finding that uh, was abused in the original uh, exploit uh, about those two um, API services. So this is uh, where, uh, the, where the value uh, has this Unicode D800 Unicode surrogate character. And this is the last example. Uh, in this case, uh, note the double column uh, before value two in the, in the object. Uh, this results um, in a situation where certain parsers keep the first value of the same name and some others keep the second. So basically an attacker could control, uh, in, could control what, uh, uh, in the case of a uh, vulnerable service pair, what uh, service A should be, believe that uh, field has its, as its value and what the other uh, would uh, see. So this is a, is a perfect attack primitive. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Do we have, <coughs> excuse me, do we have a question or two for Imre, parser differentials? Not at this time. Then Imre, thank you very okay. much.